Ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Risotto. All right, we are back with another baseball fan. It is Jacob from Alameda, and Jacob is here to tell his baseball story, and we'll talk about a few other different things. Jacob, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well, and uh, you know, this has been a pretty pretty fun thing that I've done so far, and you were one of the first people to actually reach out, uh, so I appreciate that. First things first, I do want to ask, what is kind of your baseball background? Where you know, How did you kind of start uh, noticing the game? When did you kind of start falling in love with it? Tell us some of your, uh, your early baseball origins, if I may. Yeah. So early baseball origins was probably when I was around, I want to say four or five. And that's kind of when I have like, that's probably when I, when I could probably start remembering things. Um, and one of my fondest memories is just watching my dad, um, watching the TV and he's watching San Francisco Giants baseball games. And my dad wasn't a big fan. He's kind of a casual fan. Um, but I became a Giants fan just because he was a Giants fan. And um, as time went on, I kind of kept in touch with the Giants. Um, I actually wasn't that big of a fan until about 2010, which is also kind of bad timing because that's also the year the Giants won the uh, World Series. But the reason it was 2010 was because that's also the year that I kind of fell in love with, with uh, analytics. Um, because um, I had three friends, um, all baseball fans. Um, they're all ace fans, unfortunately for me. Um, but uh, they were also all into analytics and we all met freshman year of high school. And so we kind of had like this baseball group that formed um, this, and this analytical minded baseball group. And I learned a lot about analytics from them. And I, I'd like to say, hopefully they learned some from me as well. But um, that entire 2010, we just had lunch together, talked about baseball, talked about analytics. Um, and then from that point on, even to this day, um, I still have these same friends. We still talk about analytics um, to this day as well. So um, I, I would say I've been a baseball fan all my life, but I didn't really become an avid baseball fan as an everyday watching, um, wondering what's going on until 2010, which is, I, I guess in some parts, lucky for me, because that's also the year the Giants won the World Series, but uh, it's also the year that uh, you can call me a bandwagon as well. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the 2010 was kind of where it all began for me. Leave it for the A's fans to introduce you to analytics. I would expect nothing more out of them. Yeah, or yeah. Less. Moneyball, all those things. And um, I'm sure you've seen the movie Moneyball. Yeah. And there's a thing in that movie, how can you not be romantic about baseball? <laughs> um, and it's true, how can you not? Because I, I feel like what separates baseball from any other sport is their analytics. Um, because I don't believe there's a single sport that goes as deep into the numbers and analytics as baseball does and how you can almost accurately sometimes predict a player's season or their ability. And so I think when you combine analytics and you combine baseball and you just combine the feeling of a stadium, going to games, eating the food, um, all those things, I think that just makes baseball so cool. And I think that makes baseball completely different than any other sport out there. Mm -hmm. And as much as the analytics piss off kind of the older group of fans, they still watch, you know, they're still showing up in the, the statistics about, you know, who watches games and what category of fans watch games. They still watch. It's still the same game, but it also opens up a whole level of sports fans to come in and, you know, guys that have majored in economics can now work in baseball. And it's, it's a really cool thing. And we're even seeing right now coaches that have background in like biotechnology and it's, it's actually pretty amazing. And it's funny you bring up analytics because I was just playing earlier today uh, out of the park baseball. I don't know if that's a game that you've ever played. Have you played OTP? I haven't actually, I've heard of it so many times, but I've oh, never got to get it. playing it. Yeah. I have to though. I have to, you have to, it's so detailed. There's so much in, uh, statistics in it. It's basically like you're a real life general manager. So I've done it a few times on this channel, by the way, I've done on the YouTube side. I don't, publish it as a podcast but uh and it's a series called um from the dugout and i have people come on and they manage a game uh they manage two teams from at some point in history like i know we had one person manage the uh 2012 giants against the 1954 giants and it was a really cool thing and it was a gameplay and it was super fun uh but out of the park baseball jacob you got to get it 
it's definitely worth the money. Wait for the new one to come out. So that's All right. I'll keep, keep my yes. eye on it. Keep your eye on it for sure. Um, I, I also want to ask, cause you know, growing up a Giants fan and I kind of hopped on the bandwagon for baseball that same year. I was eight years old in 2010 when the Giants won the world series, I was in third grade. Um, and I knew kind of who my favorite players were, but I was wondering if you have, you know, some of your favorite players growing up and watching the game. Yeah. Uh, well, my favorite player of all time is, uh, Matt Cain. Um, and I, I can't, I, well, I can't tell you why that is. And I think for me is because he was my childhood, but he was also, am I tearing up right now? I am so sorry. <laughs> that is not supposed to happen. Um, he was my childhood, but he was also just like kind of my teenage years and also some of my adulthood. Um, I basically watched him um, through my entire, well, when I was growing up, my entire San Francisco Giants fandom. And I saw, I remember his perfect game. I remember all these things about him, the way he pitched, the way he just kicked around the mound sometimes uh, all these little things about him I just remember and so Matt Cain to me was my fair player of all time just because he was my childhood but he was also my teenage years and he was also some of my adulthood so when I think of San Francisco Giants I think of Matt Cain um, first and foremost um, but you know I also think of Barry Bonds obviously because when I was four and five years old six years old he was hitting bombs in the McCovey Cove I remember watching 756 um and probably the, the biggest thing for me, um, watching Barry Bonds, who's also one of my favorite players, was just the grasp that he had on you. So what I mean by that is whenever he stepped up to the plate, even as a four-year-old kid, whenever Barry Bonds stepped up to the plate, I knew to stop whatever I was doing. And I knew to why, and I knew to watch that at bat because Barry Bonds was that good. And everybody in the room, no matter who you were, what you were doing, even if you didn't like baseball, if Barry Bonds was batting, you stopped what you were doing and you watched. And that was probably one of the biggest memories for me growing up. Barry Bonds, Matt Cain, um, Jason Schmidt. Um, my current favorite Giants player is Brandon Belt. Um, just because I feel like he's so controversial controversial, and I love that. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of Giants fans who hate him, a lot of Giants fans who love him. He's kind of like the John Cena of uh, WWE. But, um, and I, I really do like Brandon Belt because of analytics. And I feel like he's a very analytical friendly player. A lot of analytical minded people love Brandon Belt um, because he's kind of like the perfect, when he's healthy, he's kind of the perfect pa package. And he's had a history of getting hurt a lot with injuries. Um, I think he's taken a couple of fastballs to the head, unfortunately for him, um, which is just super bad luck. Um, but yeah, um, fair player of all time, Matt Cain, um, Barry Bonds, probably up there. And my favorite current player is probably Brandon, Brandon Belt. Yeah, Belt. Belt will get the uh, the the juices flowing on the timeline for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people that uh and, and I could see why watching him is different than looking at his, you know, maybe stat sheet at the end of the year. He's definitely proven to be a productive player when he's on the field. Uh did you go to Matt Kane's last game in 2017? Because I know that was a very uh, emotional time for a lot of fans. Actually, um, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, I, I went to his game. I was sitting on the uh, first base side, second row. Um, and I, how old was I? So 2017 was, God, six years ago. So I was 21 years old. And um, I, even as a 21-year-old kid, um, I, I didn't have that much money yet. I was still in college. And as a 21-year-old kid, I pleaded to my dad, um, me being a grown man at the time, almost pleaded to my dad to take me to this game um, because that was my childhood. And he did. So I went with my dad um, and I saw his last game. He pitched a pretty good game. He pitched, I think, five innings, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't a bad game. I can't remember if he allowed any runs, but um, that wasn't going through my head at all. All I remember thinking was, this is the last time I'm going to see Matt Cain pitch. And so when Bochy came and got him and, and you know, brought him off the field, he said farewell. Um, I was crying. I was crying next to my dad because, like I said, Matt Cain was my childhood. And I felt like watching him leave was like watching my childhood leave. So. Yeah. And when I, whenever I think of that game, I think of there's a uh, point in that game where he came up with the bases loaded mm -hmm. and everybody's like, is this about to happen? Like it's the script is written. And like, yeah. I, I don't know, I think he struck out or whatever, but um, nobody actually expected that, but it would have been cool, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, let's go in here to kind of a fun, a few fun ones here. Um, 
a lot of baseball movies. I've heard a few uh, get thrown out there in the ones that I've done so far. What is kind of your favorite in terms of, or maybe a few favorite baseball movies that uh, you've enjoyed over the years? Um, well, The Sandlot, I feel like is obvious an obvious one. Um, that was just, again, kind of a classic through childhood. Um, my, probably my favorite movie, baseball movie of all time is, is Moneyball. Um, just because me being an analytical minded fan, am I a pro analytics? No, not at all. But do I do it as a fun side hobby? Yes. Um, I, I love to study analytics. And when you can combine that with a movie, um, with Billy Bean, all those guys, um, that, that's just awesome to me. Um, so at Moneyball was probably my, my favorite movie, baseball movie of all time. Uh, Sandlot, um, Angels in the Outfield, always a good one. Um, Jackie wrote 42. Uh, yeah, I, I can go probably on and on about all, all the fair baseball movies because honestly, I think I like them all. Um, but if you're, if you're asking me to pick a favorite, it, it would probably be Moneyball just because again, I'm just the analytics of it and uh, just kind of the story it told. And, and also it kind of gives you an idea. Analytics really didn't get started until recently. Um, I mean, of course they had analytics back in the 2000s and it, it was even before that it was created by um, Bill James um but i i would say and i don't know if you, you would agree on this that analytics teams really didn't start using analytics until the 2010s um wasn't it really started to kind of get um get get the get the road going um because i remember like all the shifts that we see nowadays you even see a lot of teams you know batting the pitcher eighth or you see them using release pitchers to start the game um and all that happened i want to say in the last five years so analytics, I feel like we, we, we haven't even seen the climax yet. Um, we're just kind of seeing baby steps. And I'm excited to see what the data and all the uh, analytics show in, in the coming years. Yeah, no, I a thousand percent agree. I mean, it's cool to see the, uh, the analytics evolution. Like we did see the Bill James era. Then we kind of saw early 2000s where we started seeing on-base percentage become more and more of a commodity. And then in the 2000s, as you mentioned, the shifts started getting the early 2010s. Sorry, the shifts started getting more frequent. Uh, now we're kind of in the the three true outcome stage, and Statcast started, and that um, that brought in uh, defensive runs saved more, uh, launch angle, sprint speed, uh, all those fun stats. But I think the great thing about it is that we can now. Um, I don't think throw the eye test out the window, but what we can do is we could put different facts that go with the eye test, if that makes sense. So if we could say, man, that guy's fast, you know, now we could put a number on that. Or if we say, wow, that guy hits left-handed pitching really, really good. We could quantify that better. So we could now prove what our eyes tell us. And I think that's or the, the really, really cool thing about uh, analytics. And I think it's, you know, definitely something that not a lot of people are sold on, uh, I'm still kind of in the middle of it. I like the, you know, the old school thought process and I like the new school stuff too. Uh, but I, I, I'm kind of a centrist when it comes to <laughs> the baseball. <Yeah. laughs> um, but um, yeah, but th back to movies real quick. There's a lot of great baseball movies, but I feel like you can't say that about any other sports. I mean, maybe, maybe a few, but like, it's not like you could name 10 football or basketball movies right off the top of your head. I don't know. Or can you? I mean, I'll tell you what, I'm just happy that uh, baseball doesn't have a movie as bad as the football movie that just came out. I believe it was with, it's on Netflix. I believe it was with- um, Oh no, the Kevin James Sean one? No. Yeah, I, I was like, are you are, are you kidding me? And like, uh, that, that's just a horrid movie. And then just to confirm what I was thinking, I went to Rotten Tomatoes, got like a 20% or something. I could be wrong about that. Don't quote me on that, but- um. Yeah, no, you're right. I feel like, granted, I, 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 don't, I don't care about football and I don't care about basketball, um, but I, I don't, I can't even think of a movie that has, or a sport that has as many movies as baseball does and that are as impactful. Um, I mean, basketball has that Michael Jordan movie. I think it's like the Looney Tunes, right? Yeah, Space Jam. Space Jam, yeah. See, I mean, I, which I feel like is a pretty famous movie, but me just not being basketball minded, I just, believe it or not i've never watched it so yeah. yeah kevin james was the worst person to play in that movie that i mean yeah. first of all there there's there's certain roles that you could cast a guy like kevin james in and like a serious role is not the right role for, for he's him a, he's a comedian 
He's gonna make me. That's what he is. I mean, it's, I mean, it, it was a funny movie. I'll tell you that. And I feel like of... football coaches are not like they don't have that mindset of like, hey, I gotta be a comedian. You know, I gotta be funny. No. It's it's like complete miscast. But um, that's neither well, here nor there. <laughs> what really got me was um, they had Kevin James, but then they brought in Taylor Lautner. <laughs> um who i whenever i think whenever whenever i see him i just think of like twilight and uh I'm you're just, just waiting like, for women to pop out all over the place yeah yeah and it, it, honestly steven it felt like i was watching a disney channel movie oh no that, that's what it felt like so man that's unfortunate but if you want a good laugh watch it yes so. i i think i've watched a, a little I, I saw the trailer and i knew exactly what you were talking about and I think I was even dumb enough to put it on my list. And I think for the sake of, you know, getting a laugh, I might actually watch it because I am notorious for liking terrible movies, um, yeah. terrible humor too. So um, <laughs> anyways, uh, baseball food. Now I feel like this is also a very controversial one. I know you've named job Brandon belt already in this, in this uh, segment here, but let's talk baseball food. If you're going to a baseball game, you know, you're at the ballpark lounging around, what are you eating? What's the go-to thing to get? Um, well, let's see. I've been to a lot of baseball parks, but when I compare food, I always compare it to Oracle Park just because that's home. Um, Ghirardelli at Oracle Park, always, always, always. I don't care if it's negative five degrees outside. I'm getting Ghirardelli. Um, now, which inning? Because I know some people that go, I don't think any, very rarely do I hear people that go in like the first or second inning. It's usually like a sixth, seventh, eighth inning thing. It depends because it depends on how the game is also moving along. So if, if I'm watching a, a no hitter, even though it's like a second inning, I don't leave until a hit is like recorded for somebody. Um, just so I don't miss the whole, anything. Um, but if it's like just kind of a normal game, a couple hits, you know, maybe it's one to zero, zero, zero. I'll probably go like third inning, fourth inning, um, run, run there, run back real quick, grab some Ghirardelli. You know, it's got the garlic fries. Can't, can't miss out on those at Oracle Park. Um, but I will tell you, and I don't know how controversial this is, um, but the Oracle Park cheeseburgers mm. are are the most horrendous things I've ever tasted <laughs> in my entire life. I, I had one three years ago, and it was like a thousand dollars. Yeah, and um, I I almost threw up because it was just so so bad, and I, and I hate saying anything negative about the San Francisco Giants team or, or, or the, or the atmosphere there, but their cheese, their hamburger and their cheeseburgers just made me, made my stomach turn for days. So now, now I just stick to Ghirardelli. I stick to the garlic fries. Maybe there's a couple of those bacon wrapped hot dogs. Yeah. Um, those are pretty good. Um, and uh, that, that's honestly about it. I, I, I try and limit myself when I go to Giants games just because the food there is so expensive. Um, and I know if I buy one thing, I'm just going to buy more things. Um, so I, I try and keep it pretty, pretty light, but I usually don't succeed. Yeah. So, so sometimes you got to bring food in too. So, you know, do they let you, they do, they do. Oh, okay. an I they didn't let you. Hmm, they must change it. So, some ballparks change their policies, but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I have had wonders about those cheeseburgers. I mean, I've, so when you walk in the tunnel down below, um, where media enters, there's, just like a, a stack of buns of, of hamburger buns up against the wall. And I've like looked at them when I walk in, it's just like, you know, I I've kind of had a feeling that there might be some interesting takes about those, uh, those hamburgers that they're, they have at Oracle park, but yeah, the bacon wrapped hot dogs are really good um, in the ballpark. And also outside of the ballpark, when you're leaving, there's the people with the, with the little portable, um, hot dog i mean first of all when you walk out that's the exact smell that you want to smell you know yeah so. it's the best smell mm -hmm. no so. doubt about it yeah uh, um you ever had one of those uh the oak the oakland days nacho helmets i i hold on i might i have i have one from the angels stadium oh, nice. a few years like in the background screwing with it but um ne i know oakland has you know you know obviously there's the whole thing with the ballpark but i heard that food is definitely a, a silver lining the coliseum so. they've got good food um i so i i don't like saying good things about the oakland athletics just because it's more of a rivalry with my friends so all, all of my friends are ace fans and because of them i hate the a's um just because they hate the giants 
we had a higher on base percentage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's all types of things. I was literally we're all, we're all in this group together, and I every every single argument we get into about baseball, I always am the one not losing, but just getting picked on. It's just three against one mm-hmm. every single time. Um, but yeah, the A's do have good food. I will give them that. Um, the nacho helmets are really good. They are. Yeah. That's one thing that I would pop out if you ever get in those arguments again. I would just say, you know, hey, waterfront ballpark, we have it. <laughs> but then... Have it. You don't. Although they 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 might be on the uh, on the come up with that. I I read an article the other day that that apparently they got more approvals to build it. But you never know with the city of Oakland. That's one of those things so... where like I'm like you know, do you ever follow those news stories where like you'll believe it when you see it? Kind of like the CBA right now. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of in that same category where you follow it. You don't necessarily know the specifics, but mm. you'll believe it when you see it. That's, uh, but no waterfront ballpark. Uh, I do hope it does come to Oakland because you know, those A's fans deserve it. Maybe not in, uh, your eyes, but <laughs> so you could oh, give your, keep yeah. giving your friends a hard time. Yeah. The, um, the only reason I, I want them to get the ballpark is just so the Oakland A's stay because mm-hmm. I, that rivalry is important and it is a fun rivalry. And um, even though I may not care about the A's or how they do, I do, I, I do think, I, I think I care about my friends. Um, and I, I, I know if the A's moved, they would be crushed. So, yeah. And if yeah. they moved to like Las Vegas or something and, you know, you could give your friends a hard time about, you know, buying plane tickets every few I weeks know. to go to uh, games. <laughs> in Las Vegas athletics. It just doesn't, doesn't sound right. No, it doesn't. It's stupid. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, let's end it here on uh favorite baseball moment i I know that there's so many moments that we could go through uh but what is what is yours jacob favorite baseball moment um well i mean there's a lot um obviously the the three world series last pitch all that um but my but my favorite baseball moment wasn't any of that um my favorite baseball moment was watching gregor blanco um make the diving catch catch um to save matt kane's perfect game um because I remember I was sitting on my couch, just, you know, biting my nails, hoping, hoping that my favorite player gets this perfect game. Um, And I remember when he did, I just like fell on my knees. I was just like, yes, yes, he did it. But as everyone did, um, we got a a quick scare there for a second because I I forgot who hit it. Um, Jordan Schaefer. Jordan (laughs) Schaefer, yeah. Um, He hit a deep, deep ball to center field. I think it was right center. And um, at that moment, I was like, man, there it goes. My, my hopes, my dreams crushed. Matt Cain's hopes, dreams crushed. And then I remember as I was just kind of looking down, at the last second I looked up and I see Blanco just dive. And in the back of my head, I was like, it all, it all kind of happened in slow motion. I, I just kind of went in my head, no, he's not going to catch it. There's no way. Why is he there? <laughs> yeah, and then Blanco, because he comes out of nowhere. And uh, at the last second, I remember Gregor Blanco diving and making that catch, Kruten Kipe going crazy. And I remember myself like running in circles around, around my house. And uh, that was probably my favorite and most memorable San Francisco Giants moment of all time, um, watching Gregor Blanco, of all people, Gregor Blanco, who's actually in his tenure with the Giants, was a solid player. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but watching Gregor Blanco, who I'll always remember, um, saving Matt Cain's perfect game because that that catch was just absolutely incredible um and I I will never ever in my life forget that catch so yeah and and no right fielder has ever played there up until that point like shaded toward that far into the gap and nobody has done it since like right fielders they've tried visiting right fielders especially have tried to figure out oracle parks right field for years and years and years and you still see them you know shaded out towards that way but nobody was shaded you know they completely gave jordan schaefer the line um and i mean it was i've never seen a right fielder play there and blanco just uh an amazing catch um for sure uh but that's definitely a, a great moment. Uh, no doubt about it. Jacob, man, I appreciate it. This was so much fun and I appreciate you coming on and kind of sharing your baseball story with us. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you guys for listening on to the next. All right. And we are back with another baseball fan. It is Chris Estrada from Manteca. 
Chris, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks, Stephen, for having me on, man. I love watching your show, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me out. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I've been asking uh, baseball fans everywhere, and uh, you are, are one of many that uh, have come on and will come on. Uh, and I'm going to ask them all the same question. Uh, and it is, how did you get in baseball? Because everybody's got their own story on how they got into the game and how they got connected and they became a fan and they became a passionate fan. So I'm going to present you the same question, Chris. Chris, how did you become a baseball fan? Let's hear it. Man, it just started with uh, definitely with my family. You know, my my grandparents were big, especially my grandpa was a big uh, baseball fan, especially Giants fan. Um, I actually grew up um, until I was eight years old. I lived in San Leandro. My family is from the Bay Area. They live in San Mateo. And so they used to love their big diehard Giants fans. Um, so that's why, of course, I'm a big diehard Giants fan. But growing up, um, I lived in San, uh, San Leandro, like right near uh, the freeway leading to Oakland Coliseum. So actually, when I was younger, going there, we went to a lot of A's games. And really, my family was just all all baseball, everything, baseball, everything. And that's basically uh, how it started from that. So big A's fans. So how did you become a because I know you're you're a guy that follows the Giants. How did you kind of get involved with following San Francisco Giants baseball? Uh, well, like I said, I think it's from my family's big uh, Giants fans, diehard Giants fans. But I think I have a love for the A's also because I went to a lot of A's games uh, when I was younger. And we went to more Oakland Coliseum because we live right there. It was literally about a five minute drive there. Mm. So we went to a lot of games there. And I think just through that, even though I know it's weird, people hate the Giants, A's. You can only like one. But I've grown up liking, obviously, Giants is number one. But I'm a big fan of the A's, too. I follow them, too, really, as much as the Giants. So would you be a guy that would rock the split hat? You know how they have the A's on one side and the Giants on one side? Because I know a lot of people trash that hat. Are you someone that would rock that well? No, I definitely, I do not like that at all. No. When I was little, though, I used to do, I don't do this anymore. But when I was little, I remember like in elementary school, I would wear either like an A's hat or giant shirt or giant shirt or uh, backwards or whatnot. I used to do that. But no, that's uh I don't know that hat. I just find kind of ugly and whatnot. I'm like, I would not wear that. Every time I see it, I'm just like, oh no, I can't rock that. Okay, you answered that correctly. So, <laughs> yeah, no, th there's there's uh, definitely a right and wrong answer from that point of view. Uh, why is baseball different from some of the other sports? Why is it more of? I, I'm sure that you're a big bigger baseball fan than some of the other sports. What separates it from maybe football or basketball or? hockey or something like that hey that's a that's a really good question especially um you know they're the top four um teams or uh, leagues here like in the u.s and whatnot but well, the thing that sets them apart is um time the time limit it doesn't mm -hmm. have a time limit right and i think um one thing that i really like about baseball that i think many people don't really talk about too much is uh, you know how the other teams have time limit they can if they're up you know they can milk the clock or whatnot baseball no matter what happens no matter how big a lead is or whatnot no matter what the other team that's losing still gets a fair chance to the very end and i think that's a really cool aspect about that and then also of course how uh, once the season's rolling it's basically there's games every day every day it doesn't matter like if there's a bad if they your team you root for has a bad day well they can just wait on it just play tomorrow and you can lounge around, you know, get some work done while having baseball in the background, like every single night, you know, it's going to be there. It's just kind of a soothing experience, I'm sure. And I think that's also another thing, too, that like, you know, if you're watching you know, like football, you know, you're looking forward to that one day. And like if your team does bad, oh, now you have to wait on it all week, so kind of about all week. And same thing like for basketball, you know, they don't play every day, maybe sometimes. But, you know, there's a couple of days in break for baseball, you know, sometimes like there's 162 games. Even me, I, I don't watch every game. And sometimes if their team is losing, I'm just like, oh, well, they're going to lose. I'll go do something else or whatnot. Like, I don't necessarily have to watch their game because I know, oh, there's another one tomorrow. Yeah, that's definitely a great mentality about it. And uh, we hope baseball gets back soon so we could kind of be familiar with uh, that feeling again, uh, for sure, no doubt. Um, is there a guy that you always looked up to in terms of playing maybe now a current player that you like or a former player that you've always admired? Who's that guy for you? 
Oh man, you know who you know who it is? It is Tim Lincecum. When I was a little kid, he just came up when I was just entering high school, uh, 2009, 2010 era of him. And uh, when I was pitching, I mimicked his, his windup. I mimicked his, his windup. I just loved Tim Lincecum so much. And really what he did for this Giants organization, you know, bringing those three championships. And he was a big part of all of that. But uh, that, that's one of my favorite players that I just loved so much. And yeah, I like mimicked his windup when I would pitch too. <laughs> And he was somebody that really like embodied like what the city was like. I mean, he was not that big. He did not look like a baseball player in any way. He had the long hair. You know, he was a guy that would smoke weed in the city. And he was just someone that like was the embodiment of what San Francisco was. And I think fans really, really related to that. Do you feel the same? I definitely, I definitely feel feel the same. I mean, you just look at him. You're just, he, he just looks like a guy, like you just said. Like you wouldn't think that he can go on the mound and strike out 15 guys a game or whatnot, or have no hit potential stuff every night. Like it's just, he was just something else, and it was just fun to see. Yeah, too bad it was a sharp decline. Really, really uh, sucks. I know, I know. Actually, um, I remember his first game with the Angels. It was still really uh, really weird to see but i remember i went to the game they played in oakland and i think it was his only it was his first start with the angels and it was his only good start with the angels he threw six innings i think it was only he only gave up one run but i remember i went in i went with wearing my giants lincecum jersey and then i had like an, i wore an angels hat i got an angels hat for tim lincecum obviously now i wear it like for mike trout and whatnot but like i remember going and people were like where, where what's going on here why are you wearing giants and angel stuff and, I'm, and i turn around and see the wings come on the back of the jersey I'm like oh okay i see what you're doing there <laughs> just something different <laughs> yeah no it's, it's great that i was in the bay area so like giants fans could make the easy trip over and watch him pitch and debut with a different team it was definitely weird to see him in any other uniform the angels and then later the rangers in spring training um how about the how about this how about baseball movie because I know I've heard some different answers here. I haven't gotten one steady answer that I've expected because uh, I think so many people have different um, tastes in baseball. They Some people like the drama. Some people like the comedies. If you were to pick a baseball movie to, you know, kind of live by, maybe not live by, but favorite baseball movie. Let's let's just go with that. Favorite baseball, favorite baseball movie. I mean, I think it's like hard to tell I me. Mean, you can say that like for me, I like the classic Field of Dreams. I really like that one a lot. But I think also going by um, movies that I grew up with that came out when I was a kid. Like I really like enjoyed uh, like Bench Warmers and uh, like Angels in the Outfield. And uh, there was this, this movie I really liked. I think it was called um, Rookie of the Year. I think uh, with the kid, he was on the Cubs, right? And yeah. uh, he could he can throw so fast. And when I really like that one too, and I think that that was about because you know they were about kids like Angels in the Outfield one was kind of about kids also. And then I was a kid at the time, so I think I resonated with those movies more. But also, I, I other than those, I really like uh, Field of Dreams a lot too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and every kid wanted to be Henry Rowan Gardner from Rookie of the Year. Every kid like had the dream of like falling on their arm, and then all of a sudden having like a weird superpower, <laughs> and just like throwing a hundred miles an hour at the big league level. I mean, people, I still dream of doing it, and I'm sure you still uh-huh. dream of it. So it's it's definitely a weird uh, phenomenon, but it is something to relate to. Uh, someone on on one of the last ones said Little Little Big League, uh, which is the movie about the the kid who managed the Twins. It's kind of the same, you know, idea of oh yeah, yes, yeah. wanting to do that in, in your youth, and um, it, I mean, Field of Dreams is a classic. You're not wrong there. Um, that's one of the greatest movies of all time, not just baseball or sports. Kevin Costner was excellent in that. Um, oh, definitely. And what about baseball food? Because you know, I this is another one that I have not gotten a straight, you know, universal answer. Uh, people kind of mix it up you know they like hot dogs nachos I've heard what is Chris Estrada eating at a baseball game so this is a funny fact with me personally so when I go to minor league baseball games you know that, that's kind of so 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 when I go to minor league baseball games uh, I usually go like just with my friends around here we have the Modesto Nuts or the Stockton Ports and you know that's just a fun environment hang, having fun with friends right and maybe I'll just go, I mean, that's just my league ballpark. So I mostly just get like hot dog or whatnot, right? Or a slice of pizza. But 
fun fact, when I go to an MLB game, no matter what it is, I personally might get maybe like just real quick, like a hot dog, just a simple hot dog before the game. But from first pitch to last pitch, I don't leave my, I don't not like leaving my seat at all. I am that type of person. Like I cannot leave at all. Yeah. Not even, I used to be like that too. Not even during like BP, you know, I feel like even during yeah. BP, um, but al- although I will say BP needs to be more publicized. I feel like that is an event with the amount of guys trying to go deep during BP. And uh, a lot of fans don't even get to watch the home team swing it during BP now because the gates open after. Uh, but BP should be an event in its own. You know, fans love coming with their gloves. It's definitely something that should be publicized a little more than it is. But, yeah, not leaving the seat. I mean, is, is do you feel like a superstition there? Like if you leave, something's going to happen? Or is it just that you don't want to miss the game? Uh, yeah, I definitely, I feel like it's super, not necessarily a superstition, I'd say, but yeah, I just don't like any time missing a pitch. Like sometimes when I go with my family, um, they'll, sometimes they'll have me like go get food or something, especially like my, when I go with my sister, who's also a big Giants fan. Um, but sometimes, you know, she'll ask me to go get food and then something happens and I get mad. <laughs> and I like, see, that's why I don't like leaving my seat. Yeah. At least there's the TVs there on the concourse, but it's still not, you know, it's not fun. So you, you want to mm-hmm. see the live act. That's why you're there. That's why you paid for the ticket and you might be missing something that is worth the price of admission. So, you know, nobody likes to leave their mm-hmm. seat exactly. uh, during the game. Uh, and so many big moments uh, that you've witnessed as a baseball fan, if you were to pick one or maybe like two or three, what would be your, your Holy grail of baseball moments? Favorite baseball moment. Um, okay. Okay. Personally, for me, I think is how great it was, was the Giants uh, winning the 2010 World Series. Um, and I think that moment resonates with me more because, like, especially like my dad, he had been a gi- at the time he was 50. And, you know, he had just been seeing Giants heartbreak forever. He had never seen them win at all. It's just heartbreak after heartbreak. Even to this day, like we're like Giants fans spoil. We've seen three world championships. Sometimes he still jokes around. He's still mad about 2002. <laughs> and whatnot but like just seeing how happy he was like when they won the the 2010 world series was just a great moment that i can always um will always cherish about that just seeing how excited he was because he had been waiting all year or all his life for it and then me at the time i was um i was 15 at the time when i saw them win the first one and he was 50 so that was a pretty cool mo- um moment for that but So that's that. And then for baseball moment, what I, my favorite one is that I think doesn't get talked about a lot. And I think it gets underrated because, you know, you have that East coast, West coast bias and you know how the national media doesn't really talk about like the giants or anything. Right. At West coast is always mostly like Dodgers, everything. Right. And I think it's um, how historic was the uh, Madison Bumgarner performance of 2014 like not just the world series, but the whole playoffs, like in general, like, I don't know if we'll ever see someone pitch that many innings in a whole postseason again, especially with the way uh, starting pitching is developing. Now teams are mostly throwing out the guys for like five, six innings. And then for the relievers now. Um, And then we've seen in these recent years, how teams have tried to replicate what Bruce Bochy and Madison Bumgarner did and they failed at it. And to see, and I think that that's doesn't just doesn't get talked about enough about how great that really was that we witnessed. Nobody's ever doing that again, at least in our lifetime. Um, mm-hmm. They won that championship with PV, Hudson, um, Vogel song, Lincecum. Like, how do they how do they win with that pitching staff? It just would never happen. But I guess you know Bumgarner pitching lights out in that postseason, that World Series especially. I mean, they could put Mad Bum on the ring, and I think people would have been happy. Um, But no, those are great picks. And obviously, I think if your dad was 50 when they won the 2010 championship and you were 15, is there any hard feelings there? Like, oh, you got to see one right away. It's not fair. (laughs) No, no, not necessarily that. Um, But actually, my sister, um, who's a couple years younger than me, she feels super spoiled. So every time they won a World Series, we went to the first two parades. 
but the third one at the time I was in college and I actually had work that day so I couldn't go and I remember my sister was really upset because she's like we're, we're not going to pray we like she she thought she, it, it to her it became like a uh, like almost like an annual thing like every other year like oh it's parade year they're going to win this year and then they won and like oh we're going to the parade well I can't actually and she got all set we always go <laughs> so I thought that something like that was just pretty funny like at the time like how spoiled like it felt like we were like spoiled you know it's like oh this is happening more this should not be happening yeah the Bay, the Bay Area is spoiled I mean we've seen some good 49er teams the Warriors have won championships the Giants the A's have been in the postseason quite a bit um it's it's definitely a, a great time to be a bay area sports fan for sure before we head out here chris i want you to tell everybody what is on your hat oh what is on my hat so this is the hat that uh the brand new san jose giants um beer batter hat so they have this uh and churro i think that's supposed to be no that's not that's just a beer batter hat so they also they're also famous for churro which actually have that hat over here too somewhere how many hats do you have Oh, I have a lot. I have a lot over here. I, I, I'm a big uh, baseball uh, hat hat collector. Mm, I really like I like I really like wearing hats. So there. So the Stanley Giants are famous for the churros, and they had this uh, churro hat here. And then last year they debuted for. They're also big for their beer batter that they have promotion. So they'll pick a guy uh, pregame, and uh, he'll be the beer batter. And if the Stanley Giants pitcher strikes him out, then their beer is half off for. Uh, like a next half inning and they actually made a, a hat of that so it's supposed to be the bat and they and it's a uh, and then there's a k right there for the beer batter strike out roll <laughs> so out the barrel that's a hat. <laughs> yes exactly because also i'm a big uh my baseball fan i actually uh work in minor league baseball with the modesta nuts here so i'm a big uh follow minor league baseball really well and i'm a big fan of that Awesome. Yeah. And I'm repping the San Jose Giants here too. Exactly. Definitely, definitely a lot of fun going to those games. Chris, I appreciate you kind of telling your story and uh, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thank you. It was really a uh, awesome experience. Thank you for having me. All right. On to the next. All right. We are back with yet another baseball fan. It is Jacob Cisneros and uh, Jacob joins us. Jacob, how you doing? Welcome. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Stephen. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. You know, uh, I, we're recording this right now. I think I recorded the previous two when the baseball lockout was still happening, but now the baseball lockout's been lifted. The owners and the players agreed to terms. I think we're going, I think I'm doing pretty well. How about you? Yeah. How do you feel uh, about I'm, that whole situation? I'm honestly, you know, I'm surprised, but glad relieved is another word I would use. Um, I, it's just great for baseball, you know, the whole back and forth thing, like, with the CBA talks, I think it was just upsetting fans, really, just seeing both sides go at it. But um, it's great that they came to a deal and baseball got saved, essentially. Yeah, and, and all the nights of all those deadlines, it would always be, you know, they're, they're gaining momentum. And then the next morning, they're like, oh, you know, the momentum is gone. And it was just getting really frustrating and tedious. And I think everybody's glad, including the players and the owners, that that's all behind us. Um, but no, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, we're going to talk about your journey to be uh, becoming a baseball fan, some of your your favorites, per se. So I first want to ask kind of how you got into the, uh, first of all, where are you from? Where, where What section of, uh, of uh, the United States are you in right now? Um, so yeah, I'm California, Southern California, more specifically. Um live in the San Bernardino area so probably like the midpoint would be like almost where Rancho Cucamonga Quakes are and um, Inland Empire 66ers down there so yeah about an hour away from Los Angeles and I know for a fact because uh, I follow you of course and uh, you are a big uh, Angels guy so tell me about growing up with baseball how did you kind of get into the sport and uh, you know tell me about uh, loving those Angels yeah, so um, it was kind of interesting and weird in a way. Um, I played a little t-ball, nothing too much. Like like every little child played t-ball <laughs> growing up. Um, I didn't really get into it until about middle school. I don't really know specifically what got me into it. I just um, was flipping through the channels one day, and I was was on um, MLB Network one day, and uh, was watching it. You know, um, it was great seeing like the color commentary there, like with those guys, like Greg Amsinger and like 
I think was on and they they just made baseball fun honestly like when they were talking about it like that drew me in and so then like um I would also play like a little bit of MLB the show um the 08 version which was when like oh, wow. I really started getting into it so I was like maybe I should just start like you know following it I'm like I'm an Angels fan so I might as well just like you know keep with it and eventually you know it turned into more baseball fan really so MLB the show I think is such an underrated tool to get people in and I guess the same goes for whoever plays 2k and and uh, Madden and NHL all those games because you get to really know the players and you get to really know who's on what team uh so like have you played every MLB the show since 2008 so I put yes and no I played a lot um when it was around like the ps3 playstation 3 era and um once the consoles w- once i needed to upgrade i went to xbox and obviously they didn't have it so um now i got there's a little bit of a gap but now i'm back on it on xbox so it's like it's weird because like i remember still how much fun i had with it but at the same time like i'm on xbox so it's a little bit weird yeah no you have some catching up to do because i will yeah. be the show back on xbox uh there there's a few i wonder how the gameplay is i wonder if it's the same i have a ps4 so um i can't get any more new mlb the show games unless i upgrade so it's like damn um but you know whatever we'll we'll deal with it um <laughs> so why do you love baseball so much like what is it about the game that kind of separates it from you know maybe football because i know the uh, southern california area it's got a lot of basketball basketball is a big thing down there Football still, I think, is up and coming. You know, obviously the Rams uh, are down there and, uh, you know, they've had success. Um, But where are you in terms of, you know, baseball, its popularity right now? Why do you think that baseball is the best sport? Or do you think that baseball is the best sport? Yeah, um, actually, I do think baseball is the best sport. Um, You know, it's one of my favorites. I love to cover it. I love to write about it. It's some, you know, it's just, it's awesome. Um, comparing to the other sports, like you said, like the Los Angeles area, you have the Lakers, the Clippers, obviously the Rams, Chargers down here now. Um, it, I don't know. It's just different. It's like, I think we were in a space one night and like you even said, it, it's like going to church. Like um, many people attend, few would understand it. And honestly, I just got it. Like, and I love the strategy of the game. Um, like, seeing I honestly it was a little weird because like I know like the shift has been like controversy but like watching those players like move around the infield I was like whoa okay what's happening like the first time I saw it and so it was just like that strategy of the game just trying to like outbeat your opponent like you don't have to you know it's not just a bunch of home runs it's not a bunch of strikeouts like there's people you gotta get on base you gotta steal bases like there's little intricate parts of the games that I think like if you're just like a casual fan, you'll probably miss it. And so that's what really got me invested into it. I guess the little intricate details. No doubt. You brought up the shift. So I want to ask you, because I'm pretty indifferent about it. I don't care either way. I see both sides of the argument. Where do you stand on the shift? You know, I'm a little bit impartial myself. I really, um, I didn't mind it when it was like, when I first saw it, like, like I said, I think the strategy of the game's like better like more intriguing but from a hitting standpoint i like i understand like i'm not gonna go up to like say like joey gallo who's been like you know like the anti-shift because of like what it is to left-handed hitters but um i i see his point like i'm not gonna like bash him and say hit it to the left side it's not easy like i get it i i completely understand so um as far as just like my overall opinion if you had to make me choose i'm for the shift just because i like seeing how how to beat your opponent it's like i said it's intricate part of the game you're trying to beat your opponent any way you can no doubt about it and i so the two sides that i see it you mentioned one of them was you know there if there's so many guys on one side of the infield hit the ball the other way hit the ball to where they're not and it's easier said than done um and and i always hear you know other sports you could put your defense wherever you want that should be the same in baseball i get that too and then the other side of the argument which these are some points that i kind of like you know i want to see infielders dive again 
Because we're at the point right now where, like, there's a ground ball back up the middle, a ball that, you know, 10 years ago you would lay out for, and the guy's positioned right there. Like, I think the entertainment value would go up significantly because, I mean, we have Mike Moustakis and Travis Shaw playing second base. I mean, what I, I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the appeal in that. So, you know, Max Muncy playing second base. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to see um, that. I almost said to see that shift uh, play on words there. Um, but no, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I, I think it's going to be banned in 2023, which gives, um, they weren't going to do it this year. You know, some teams and front offices obviously design their team a certain way to win and whether that get, you know, getting a, a pitcher because it gets a lot of ground balls to the right side or creating your middle infield accordingly, you know, they don't want to mess any of that up. So I, I applaud them for doing it next year and not this year. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to get at was um, you, you do some, some writing right now uh, about the angels. How did you kind of get into that? Cause I think that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So um, I write for Halo Hangout, which is part of fan sided, you know, they're, um, they're just like a big group, a big community of like fan, fan based writers. And honestly, I was scrolling through Twitter one day and I just found, you know, an application. They were Halo Hangout was like, hey, we're looking for writers. Um, if you have interest in the Angels, it's a great place to write. And it's been awesome ever since I applied, got the position. And it's been like I said, it's been awesome uh, getting to write whatever I want. And it really made me more of an unbiased. I think like it kind of took that bias away from me where. I'm not just going to sit there and defend the angels a hundred percent. Like I'm going to like, it may force me to break down the little parts of the game. Like, okay, how's their pitching? How's their hitting? You know, how's the bullpen? Like it really made me think in a different way rather than just go all in fan a hundred percent. And if, if you like start looking and when you're forced to start looking at a team from a neutral like side of things, and you were a fan of that team, like they will, they will make sure to do everything to make you hate them. Like that, that's basically like that. That's what I've learned. And it's like, oh God, the giants are doing this. Like the, you know, it's the angels are doing that. I mean, it's, they will do everything to make you despise them by the end of it. So I think that's, that's pretty funny. Uh, is that something that you want to do, you know, moving forward, like as a kind of career plan, do you want to get into sports media? Yeah. So, um, I definitely have been thinking about it. It's been kind of a tough decision for me because of the way I think like um, the job industry is right now. I'm, I won't, I don't want to get like too into it, but like for me, I just thought like it's very competitive, obviously, respectively, like everyone's been, everyone I've talked to is a great writer. Like everyone has their own talents in a way. And so just coming from my perspective, I think um, I really have to think about it is it like, do I like the writing part or do I like the sports part? And that's kind of a tough line for me right now. I'm an English major. So I'm kind of like having that kind of Liberty to kind of do what I want and kind of see, but um, you know, anything can happen down the road. Um, Right now I love writing about the the angels baseball in general too. It's um, it's definitely like a luxury that I think people like wouldn't understand if they weren't doing it. It's definitely something that like, went from a hobby to something like, Hey, I can probably do it professionally if you know, you get good enough. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. So moving on here, I do want to ask about, um, you know, maybe some favorite players that you've had over the years. Cause I think one of the things that I've noticed in youth baseball is, you know, you ask a, a kid now, who's your favorite player. And they say, well, I don't have one. And that's concerning to me. Everybody has to have a favorite player. In my opinion, uh, I had a favorite player. I'm sure you have, former players that you liked current players that you admire so who are some of those guys yeah so um honestly going back to mlb the show which is pretty funny um it kind of got me into like understanding more about the angels roster growing up and for me i don't know why i just had a fascination with pitchers and really the battery between like pitchers and catchers so going into it i really like john lackey growing up that when he was you know like he was kind of establishing himself as like the veteran of the club. And then like um, another one was uh, Mike Napoli when he was catching. Um, he caught a little bit for the Angels. So like, I don't know, it's just like that combination of pitching and catching. So definitely John Lackey. 
Mike Napoli, and then just to throw out another one, maybe Tori Hunter even. I know, like, um, it's funny because, like, the game kind of, like, talks about, like, he had seven gold gloves. Like, it's it, like the commentary gets you a little bit, like, thinking, like, this is a great player. Like, I want to know him. I want want to know everything about him. Yeah, Boog Shambi and uh, Chris Singleton are going to be the new announcers for MLB 22, the show. So stay tuned for that. Um, but I just thought of, I very randomly, I thought of a moment that Mike Napoli, John Lackey, and Torrey Hunter were all associated in in the later part of their career. The 2013 division or, uh, championship series where Lackey and Napoli were on the Red Sox, Torrey Hunter went over the wall on the David Ortiz Grand Slam, and you know they were all on the field for that. So I think that was pretty yeah. – I don't know why. That, that's crazy. That's another good thing about baseball is that you could have – Moments like those where everybody's connected. So I think that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, do you have a favorite baseball movie? This might get uh, a lot of people riled up. So you got to be careful here with your answer, Jacob. <sighs> Let's see. Um, on, Angels honestly, in the outfield. <laughs> no, actually, surprisingly. Um, I have, I've seen a lot of good baseball movies. Like, But honestly, I don't know why it got me like a lot of the times. Um, it's actually Moneyball. Um, I know it's probably like one of the more recent baseball movies. Uh, there's a lot of classics out there, but um, honestly, I didn't really know about Moneyball till the movie. And like, I knew a little bit about statistics, but I didn't know how big it like exploded until that movie came out. And I was just like, I was hooked. I was like, okay, so here's what's like going on really within the game. And then, you know, once you start researching it after the movie, I think it kind of like led me like down like, a hallway of like more stuff to learn about so um i you know as far as like the the story of it goes it's like it's interesting with the whole 20 game streak and then you know you you kind of it's almost like you kind of want, want to root for the a's a little bit like not saying that i'm an a's fan of course not but it's like you like they show them as the underdog and you kind of want to root for them it's like okay you're facing rich teams and it's just like we got to think about something else to kind of beat them. So it, it's a great movie. I think um, for a baseball fan and someone that wants to learn more of like how it got to the way it is with statistics. I always like the, uh, well, first of all, you know, it's a big deal when Brad Pitt is playing Billy Bean like that, that just doesn't, Absolutely. that just doesn't happen. But my favorite scene is the the trade deadline and they get a deal done. And then Jonah Hill does the, the, you can't see it because my background, but the, the fist pump. Oh yeah. That, that's one of my favorite scenes. But um, if you haven't already, I would read, read the book too. the book more so than the movie. Like I finished the book and I was like, wow, I want to be a GM. <laughs> like I want to yeah. be a GM now. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I know like they even, I think they like feature the book in the movie. Like they kind of like he was reading, Billy Bean was reading it on the airplane and like they kind of give you like a page of like notes of like, okay, well, here's like the equation if you break it down. And I'm like, now I kind of want to read the book because like yeah. it really gets into it. So yeah, you will memorize the entire like I think it's like 02 or 03 draft. And like like there's a whole chapter about how like do they want to get Nick Swisher in the first round? Or like it was like it it was insane the amount of information that was in that book. Michael Lewis is a great writer. And a great movie for sure. Uh, what about baseball food? This is another one that could be, you know, very, uh, you could offend some people. And I know the Angel Stadium does have pretty good food, doesn't it? Yeah. So they have, um, I'm not into them, but like they have the nacho helmets. And um, those I'm ones. I'm not into them either. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got them a couple times just with like family and friends. Um, I'll kind of pick at them, but oh, yeah. They have, yep. There you go. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's just because, like, people can take them home and, like, you know, it's a fun memory. So, definitely, I think those – I know they have the Sundays, too, that come in the same hat, I think. Um, but for me, my favorite ballpark food, honestly, it's like a hot dog with ketchup. I don't know why. It's just – it it goes together, base, baseball and a hot dog. Like, something about it makes me think, like, summertime – especially like the day games it's like summertime day game you're sitting down relaxing with the hot dog and then later on in the game i like to do popcorn like probably around like the sixth seventh inning i'll do like a popcorn like 
real quick and then I'll be good for the rest of the game. And a lot of the Giants fans I talk to say, yeah, around the seventh, eighth inning, we like to do Garadelli ice cream, which they have in the, the left field corner. So everybody has like their late inning snack that they can't miss. That's something that I've learned. But um, yeah, no, I, I have like, yeah, I mean, I don't know why I just pulled that up, but you know, whatever, we're, we're, <laughs> we're going to roll with it. Um, and then finally, you know, as an angel fan and as a baseball fan, you've probably had a few really awesome baseball moments that you've witnessed. So what is one that kind of sticks out? Yeah. Um, honestly, for me, there was a couple. Yeah. Picking from a know, can of worms there. Yeah. Um, one of them for me was Mike Trout's first cycle. I don't know why that stood out to me right now. Um, just because I think when we think of like Mike Trout, like the number one player in baseball, um, there was so much stuff that he hadn't accomplished yet. And it was just like, you knew he was going to get the cycle. You just didn't know when. And so then like to be able to do it. And I think it was at his home at the home ballpark. If I remember, it was just like all the fans cheering and stuff. You knew it was going to happen, but you didn't know when. And then um, another favorite moment for me was, more somber, but um, the no hitter for um, Tyler Skaggs that um, first start against our after his passing, I think that was just like a rallying moment for the team. And so, um, yeah, those are my two favorite moments. And wasn't it like that? There, there's like a weird situation with the Skaggs thing where like the amount of hits and the amount of runs was like his birthday or something. Yeah, that I think I think that did happen, and like you said, it's weird how baseball connects. Oh, there's baseball like, gods; they exist. Oh yeah, yeah. Like going back to like the John Lackey and Mike Napoli, like the baseball gods are real, like mm-hmm. for sure. I don't doubt it, and it's just funny how like you know numbers add up like that, and so um, even like the story itself, you know, I could have never predicted a no hitter like the next game after that, so. Um, it's weird. I think um, I'm sure if you ask like players, they would probably think like there was something different about that game. Um, for me as a fan, you you definitely knew there was something different about that game. You wanted to see like how the players were reacting. You want to see how they would perform. Like it's definitely it was a rallying moment. I think they that team definitely came together. I think in that one night. I was in Southern California when that happened, actually in San Diego. And, um, I was, I was in a, uh, in a submarine. Wow. <laughs> One of the, the submarines that you tore when I got the news on my phone and I was shocked. And then uh, I was still in San Diego when, uh, I saw the combined no hitter. That was really powerful stuff. And of course, um, I think any Mike Trout moment that you get to witness is significant because he's someone who's a once in generational talent and a slam dunk hall of famer as of now, no doubt about it. And if he continues, he'll be on the, you know, he's on the Maris or not Maris mantle and maze and DiMaggio. He'll be up there among those guys. Um, no doubt about it. Jacob, man, I appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks again for having me, Steve. All right. On to the next.